Hi class, welcome back. This week I want to give a lecture on eating disorders. You have two other additional PowerPoints to review which are important. They're about assessment and as you review them feel free to ask me questions as you go but you, you guys could review that on your own and we could discuss it in the discussion board. But I really want to spend some time on eating disorders this week. I don't know how much of this you'll get in any other class. If you do touch on it, it will likely be brief, but these are very complex, dangerous disorders identified as process addictions. So I really want you to leave here with a solid foundation on what eating disorders entail and what they all come with. So eating disorders has been on the rise in the past three decades, and that may be because now we're more educated on it although we still have a long ways to go, or it may be because we live in a culture where thinness is an ideal and equates to beauty. Um, there are ma two main diagnoses that have been around for a long time. That's anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. However, there's a third that's been added to the DSM-5 called binge eating disorder, also known as food addiction. This was uh, could have been identified in the DSM-4 TR, the, the DSM before the DSM-5. However, it was categorized under eating disorders not otherwise specified, so there wasn't a specific category for the diagnoses. So while the fear of gaining weight is really prevalent in anorexia and bulimia, in binge eating disorder, it's not to that same degree. People with this disorder display many of the other features found in anorexia and bulimia, however, because they all stem from the same place, you guys. So these individuals, likely they come from a trauma background, just like with other addictions. Either they were sexually abused, physically abused, or if there was no abuse, there's no, no external abuse, they could have been raised in a really rigid, strict environment that promoted perfectionism. Maybe their parents were really hard on them. Maybe um, they just lived in a culture or a household where body shape was very much uh, idolized and focused on. So the main symptoms of anorexia are a refusal to maintain more than 85% of normal body weight. There's an intense fear there um, that they will become overweight. So while they might have a distorted view of weight and shape, meaning like they might look at themselves and think that they're fat or think of themselves as a lot, see themselves as a lot heavier than, you know, a healthy individual would. But sometimes it's more about just the fear of gaining any ounce of weight. So they have this overwhelming fear that they're going to lose control. Amenorrhea is very common here. So that amenorrhea refers to a lack of menstrual cycles. So the person becomes so underweight and has so little body fat on them that they lose their period. You could also see this in athletes because they are so active, but this, when it comes with anorexia, it's due to a extreme um, amount of weight loss, especially in a short period of time. Three consecutive missed periods is classified as amenorrhea, but I do want to point out that amenorrhea was removed from the DSM-5 for two different reasons. One was because these individuals, a lot of times anorexics, have an artificial period. So if they lost their period, they may be on birth control, which produces a period, but they don't have a period that comes naturally. The second reason is due to men, because we know in a previous lecture, I talked about the importance of understanding and remembering that this is not only a female disorder. While we see it more in females, doesn't mean males are immune from it. So a lot of times they're misdiagnosed with depression when really they have an eating disorder. But uh, because this criteria doesn't fit for men, they have, um, for men, they'll experience difficulties in testosterone and kind of abnormal testosterone levels. 
So there are two main types of anorexia. The first is the restricting type. These are subtypes. So within kind of the umbrella of anorexia, there are two types that one could be classified as. The restricting type is probably where your head goes to first, the one that we hear most about, and that's um, losing weight by cutting out uh, fattening snacks, and they have a lot of unsafe or forbidden foods, and I'm putting my fingers in quotes here for them. They're just forbidden. They're, there's no chance, no way they're even going to get near them. Um, there's no, no variability in diet. So these individuals are very rigid and strict and they have safe foods. Uh, they probably only have a handful of safe foods that they eat. Maybe they eat at certain times. You'll see a lot of individuals with anorexia cutting up their food in really small pieces. Unhealthy, com or I'm sorry, um, irregular combinations of food. So they might mix like mustard because it's zero calories with something that you normally want to mix mustard with, maybe like carrots or something. And then you have the binge eating purging type. Now this is, these individuals under anorexia are underweight, but they lose weight by forcing themselves to vomit after any meal. So whether it's a binge or not, they'll, they're still throwing up their food. Or if they're not throwing up, using laxatives or diuretics to try to get rid of the calories, any calories consumed. Like those with bulimia nervosa, people with this subtype may engage in binges. So they may or may not kind of have an unhealthy binge, which is consuming a ton of calories. Um, probably not as often as bulimia because that would convert to bulimia nervosa. Um, and they're the really the main thing here in differentiating between anorexia, binge purge, binge purge type, and bulimia nervosa is their weight. You know, so someone with anorexia binge purge type is going to be underweight, while someone with bulimia is either going to be at a normal weight or overweight. So as I said, about 90 to 95% of cases occur in females, but we can't forget about that 5 to 10%. Again, I'm going to highlight that just because we don't hear a lot about males doesn't mean it's not occurring. Just like sexual abuse in males, the, the statistics are probably um, inaccurate because it's being either underreported or misdiagnosed. The peak age of onset of anorexia is between 14 and 18 years old. And I want to highlight here that the causes are, like I said, due to a traumatic background. It could be due to being raised in a really rigid, kind of enmeshed environment, or it could be a defense mechanism uh, while entering into a developmental stage, a different... So when someone's becoming an adolescent to an adult, it could be really scary and they might feel like a loss of control. So sometimes people will regress back into like an earlier stage of their life when they felt safe and kind of thrive off this feeling of being taken care of, being sick, not being healthy because they feel like it's a source of security. Rates of anorexia are increasing in North America, Europe, and Japan. So not just like the Western cultures. So the typical case, and again, they all look differently. So there's no, I mean, with any diagnosis, they don't all look the same, right? There's, you know, every individual is different. But for the typical case, the general case, a normal to slightly overweight female has been on a diet. So Maybe someone started off either a normal at a normal body weight or maybe just a smidge overweight and they begin to diet, lose weight. They start getting attention for it and it kind of escalates and exacerbates. And um, maybe something, it's kind of like a perfect storm. Like they started off normal or slightly overweight. They always have low self esteem. They maybe had a trauma background or were raised in a really rigid, strict, perfectionistic environment. They start to lose weight. 
they get attention for it, they like it, something stressful happens, such as a separation of parents, so, or move away from home, so either um, maybe someone goes to college, or experience a personal failure, so something maybe a traumatic experience happens in the school or in a social setting, and then it kind of spirals out of control. Um, most patients do recover. However, I will say here, it's important to note that relapse is not uncommon, unfortunately. A lot of times they will, individuals will get to a kind of a sub-marginal healthy weight just to get medically in the clear. So people are off their backs because they're medically stable, but they still have disordered eating behaviors. And unfortunately, about two to 6% become seriously ill and die as either a result of medical complications. So maybe their heart gave out because they were so weak and frail or die by suicide because anorexia is highly, highly, highly comorbid with depression and anxiety as well as OCD. So what I wanna note is that Recovery, oftentimes in anorexia, is a lifelong thing. Um, it's same with alcoholism, substance addiction. Someone is always kind of, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm in recovery. This is, I'm anorexic, but I, I have had anorexia and I'm in recovery. Again, I, I, I should have been careful with where I worded that because no one is their diagnosis, right? Um, someone has a diagnosis, but they're not, they are not their diagnosis, but someone from recovering from anorexia usually have to work towards it um, for, for a long time. It's not a quick fix and it takes a lot of work. So the key goal for people with anorexia is, is becoming thin. So the driving motivation of their fear is fear of becoming out of control, losing weight and becoming obese, giving in to the desire to eat, so if I eat, I'm a failure, or losing control of their body size or shape. So if I start to gain weight, even though I know I'm not healthy and maybe to survive, I need to gain weight, but what if I can't stop? What if my body spirals, spirals out of control? So it's these overwhelming fears and these erroneous beliefs that kind of keep them sucked in to this disorder. So interestingly, something that I want to know is that the term anorexia literally means absence of appetite. However, that is an inaccurate description of the actual diagnosis because anorexia doesn't mean that someone loses their appetite. These people experience hunger, they're hungry, but they ignore it, they learn to get past it. There's actually a high, a brain high that comes with uh, getting past that hunger. So there's, a, there's actually a point of euphoria once you've kind of gotten past that starving stage and you don't feel it anymore. These people get a a high in a sense, but something that's kind of contradictory towards their symptoms is they're very preoccupied with food. So these individuals are, they're, they're not eating. They are always thinking about food, planning meals, obsessing about their calories, maybe cooking for other people, reading about different recipes. Um, and it's because of food deprivation so this is really interesting. In the 1940s, there was a starvation study, which was a study on what happens and what changes in the brain when starvation occurs. So veterans or soldiers were um, given the opportunity to participate in this study. And if they participate in the study, they didn't have to go to war. So many people did. And a lot dropped out. There was a lot of attrition because it was very, very hard. But they were told that they could only eat 1,600 calories a day, which for us now in society, nowadays, that sounds like kind of a normal amount. 
Um, but for them, and especially for men, that was a restricted amount. So what happened was um, these individuals became very emaciated. They looked like those individuals in concentration camps. And they tracked um, they looked at the differences in the brain, what happened to the brain, what happened to their moods, what happened just to their quality of life, and it all, as you could imagine, declined. And when they were able to start eating again, a lot of them would gorge themselves. So they ended up having a lifelong issue with food, and they were constantly binging because of the the result of food deprivation. So a long period of food deprivation often leads to binge eating. That's why like when in diets you see people they'll do really really they'll be really really rigid with their diet and then they'll have one cookie and it'll lead to a binge. Well, it's the same type of thing. That's why diet plans and everything that we see in the diet world and the advertisement set us individuals and society up for failure because the weight is usually going to be gained back because of the consequence of starvation. So this is a good time to note that 60% of individuals with anorexia eventually cross over to bulimia. And that is because of this food de deprivation. So eventually they'll end up binging. So they, there's also the cognitive piece that comes with anorexia. So they think in distortive ways. So usually they have a very low opinion of themselves, their self-worth, their self-body image, and they tend to over, overestimate their actual proportions. So uh, whether it's the way they look or the amount of food they're consum consuming, and they hold maladaptive attitudes and mis- perceptions including I must be perfect in every way I will be a better person if I deprive myself I can avoid guilt by not eating if I eat I'm a failure etc so there's this huge cognitive distortion and maladaptive thinking patterns that come with anorexia there's also the um, comorbidity piece so with anorexia comes with depression, you're gonna see anxiety, you're gonna see low self-esteem, you're gonna see insomnia or other sleep disturbances either due to their unhealthy body or depression. Substance abuse um, is more common with bulimia and OCD is huge with anorexia. Perfectionism is huge with bulimia and anorexia. So kind of along with the psychological piece, there's the physical piece too. So caused by starvation comes amenorrhea, like I said, lack of menses, low body temperature, because they have such low body fat, their, their temperature is really low, low blood pressure, which can lead to bradycardia, which is a really slow heart rate, body swelling, um, actually like someone who's starving will maybe have a really bloated stomach for their, for their body. Uh, kind of like you see in those rural areas or the little um, children who look emaciated, but they kind of have an extended belly that's due to starvation, reduced bone density because they're not absorbing proper amount of calcium. Like I said, slow heart rate, also called bradycardia metabolic and electrolyte imbalances, dry skin, brittle nails. So you might see like, um, like their lips are probably going to be cracked. If it's, you know, really extreme, their hair is brittle, poor circulation and lanugo, which is a condition that your body actually starts to grow a fine layer of hair, like on your face or your stomach. And that is literally the body trying to keep warm. So I'm going to pause here and take a minute. I'm going to breathe. I want you to breathe. That was a lot of information to take in. I want you to 
think of any questions, maybe pause here, maybe get up, stretch. I'm just gonna take a minute and take a deep breath myself. Okay, so moving on to bulimia nervosa, also known as binge purge syndrome, characterized by binges, repeated bouts of uncontrolled overeating during a limited period of time. So eating objectively more than most people would or could eat in a similar period. So a lot of times it's binges are thousands of calories, 5,000 calories, 7,000 calories, 3,000 calories. So more than someone would be eat in a day would be eaten in one sitting. Oftentimes it's done very quickly and in secret. So they're all alone. The binges could be planned. So someone's could have planned periods of when they know they're going to binge, or they could be spontaneous. Say someone had a stressful day, they come home, they eat a tub of ice cream, and that leads to a bigger binge. So with this comes a lot of guilt and shame. Along with the binging comes with an inappropriate compensatory behavior, which means an attempt to get rid and eliminate of eliminate the calories just consumed. So either by forcing themselves to vomit, misusing laxatives, diuretics, or enemas, maybe fasting for a long period of time after, so not eating for you know as long as they can, which we know in turn leads to another binge, and exercising excessively. So any of these way, any of these things can be classified as a purge. So just anything anyone trying to get rid of the caloric intake that they just consumed. But in reality, the reason why those with bulimia nervosa are either the same weight or overweight is because they're consuming so many calories, it's really realistically impossible to um, purge up all of the calories especially when vomiting, you could only get rid of about 50% of the calories. So like anorexia, about 90, 95% of bulimia occurs in females and the peak age is between 15 and 21. And symptoms may last for several years with periodic let up. So they may go through a period of abstinence and then something comes up in their life and they don't, um, they go back to their old habits. Again, this is not as easily detected as anorexia because these individuals look um, normal, if you will. Oh, this is, yeah, what I said, patients are generally in, of a normal weight. Um, and these kind of individuals, as we hear the term yo-yo dieting, you'll see these individuals really have large weight fluctuations depending on the number of binges they are participating in um, at that time in their life. So these individuals may, you might notice significant weight changes, whereas the average person maintains a normal weight with normal amounts of fluctuation that you no know, one else could really notice. These individuals, you might notice differences. Some may also qualify for a diagnosis of anorexia, which would be what? Hopefully you thought of the anorexia binge purge type, right? So many teenagers and young adults go on occasional binges or experiment with vomiting or laxatives after hearing about these behaviors for friends on the media. So yeah, unfortunately, um, you hear about teens or adolescents when they hit puberty and are experimenting or experiencing weight gain, you know, normal increased body fat because, you know, they're going to start their periods or have started their periods. They kind of just like with drugs may experience, experiment with using laxatives or uh, purging after meals. About 20 to 20 or about 25 to 50 percent of students report periodic binge eating or self-induced vomiting but only some of these individuals qualify for a diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. So you have to go through a certain amount of binges and purges each week to actually be diagnosed. And I attached a 
uh, handout of the DSM-5 changes in comparison to the DSM-4 TR. So I want you guys to look at that because there are changes in the eating disorder category. It's, I believe it's actually called feeding and other eating disorders. So people in bul with bulimia may have between one and 30 binges each week. So it could get, there's a wide spectrum of what it looks like, but it could be, get pretty extreme. Like I said, they're secretive about it. They don't do it in front of other people. Um, the binges, not only are they eating it really quick and it's a large amount of food, but there's little chewing. So these individuals really aren't even sitting, like enjoying, joining, enjoying a meal, they're mindless about it. So instead of being mindful as what healthy eating entails, they're mindless. They don't pay attention to their bodies. They don't, you know, um, leptin, which is the chemical in our brains that let us know that we're full. That's completely, you know, kind of erased. They're disconnected with their bodies. So they are just kind of eating on autopilot. They might almost even disassociate while they're binging. Like I said, binges can eat as many as 10,000 calories per binge episode, which is a lot. So this is very, very sad. And you could imagine after a binge, just like someone might go on like a drinking binge, the feeling of guilt arises. Same with binges. So although they might feel comforted and pleasurable. So dopamine may be on the high, really, really um, overstimulated, follows the guilt and blame, depression, and fear of gaining weight and also being discovered. They might feel, dis I've, those with bulimia that I've worked with describe it as feeling disgusting and just feel ashamed. So then comes in the compensatory behaviors. So they want to undo what they just did. So they may resort to vomiting. Um, and actually what comes with vomiting, what most of us, a healthy adult or a healthy adolescent, healthy person, we don't like throwing up, right? It's gross. It's a horrible feeling. It's a feeling of loss of control. But these individuals actually get a high from it. So just like individuals who get past the starvation point in anorexia have a feeling of euphoria, same with the feeling of purging. So like I said, vomiting fails to prevent the absorption, absorption of half the calories consumed during a binge. So only about 50% of calories during a binge are eliminated. So think about it. If someone binges up to 10,000 calories, they the most they could get rid of the most is 5,000 calories. And you have to really, really, I mean, this is graphic, but you know, throw up a lot. And so 5,000 calories is m more than double, which someone should be consuming in a day, depending on their activity level, body type, male, female. So that is weight gain, right? So that is why people with this disorder often either are a normal weight or, or uh, overweight person. And repeated vomiting affects the ability to feel satiated, meaning feeling satiated, what does that mean? Satisfied, right? So if I'm satiated with chocolate, eventually I'm going to feel full, I might feel sick, and naturally I stop eating it, right? But the repeated vomiting effects messes with that, and therefore their hunger and, um, their hunger cues kind of go all out of whack and the binging cycle continues. So as you could see, just like with the substance addiction and other process addiction, it's this, it's these things, you know, what we're doing to our bodies when consuming these substances or participating in these behaviors literally alter our brain chemistry. So compensatory behaviors may temporarily re relieve the negative feelings attached to the binge eating. Over time, however, the cycle develops in which binging, purging, binging, purging, binging, and it's just this ongoing deleterious cycle. And I've attached a handout this week 
on the binge purge cycle. So you could look at that for more detail. And I, again, I'd recommend saving it because you want to build up your resource library for when you, um, whether you're working with clients now or you're not yet, you will at some point and you will likely maybe come across someone with an eating disorder. Uh, but just kind of a disclaimer, you want additional treat, you want additional training in treating eating disorders because these are very dangerous to treat, especially anorexia, but we'll get into treatment later. So again, the typical case, so what we generally see is a normal to slightly overweight female that has been on, in, on an intense diet. Research suggests that even among normal participants, binging often occurs after strict dieting. So not just with, not just with eating disorders, but kind of like, think about it this way. When someone's on a diet and you hear them say, well, I ate a cookie, so then I, I figured that I blew it, so I just ate the whole bag instead because, you know, I figured that, well, if everything's out the, the window, I might as well go on, all in. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. Because that's just the natural response to a restricted diet. That's just the human, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's survival, right? If your body's deprived from food, it's natural to want to get as much as you can when you finally do have it. Kind of like to kiddos who I've worked with who have been neglected and maybe were taken in the system and uh, went to a very functional um, foster family and were adopted, you know, with great parents. And maybe if they were neglected and didn't have enough to eat before, these kiddos naturally start to, and I've seen this in several cases, they start to hoard food. They'll hide food, even though there's plenty of it and they could, their parents aren't restricting it or they're not, you know, doing anything weird or neglectful. They hide it because they are naturally um, trying to protect themselves. So it's kind of the same idea here. Or if someone ex has experienced failure to thrive and were underweight and eventually they might gorge themselves in food and that's just a survival mechanism. So the similarities between anorexia and bulimia include um, uh, the onset often is triggered by a period of dieting, fear of becoming obese, obese drive to be thin, preoccupation with food, weight, and appearance, feelings of anxiety, depression, obsessiveness, perfectionism, characteristics, heightened risk of suicide attempts um, due to depression and loss of control, substance abuse, distorted body perception, and disturbed attitudes towards eating. Now the difference is, um, just a few to highlight, are people with bulimia are more concerned about pleasing others, being attractive to others, and having intimate relationships. So anorexia uh, isolate. They will isolate themselves. They don't really care about anything other than their weight and food. They lose a lot of their interpersonal relationships. It's just not a priority to them. Uh, they might not even really care about being attractive. Uh, they just want to be skinny, right? I mean, that's really what their thoughts are going, you know, their, their actions are going to. Whereas bulimia, they're more social. They might not, they probably won't isolate themselves. They want to be attractive and they want, they have desired, um, they desire relationships. People with bulimia also tend to be more sexually experienced and active. So a lot of times with anorexia, you'll, uh, if someone comes in in their late 20s they, and have been suffering with anorexia since their teens, they are likely not to have had any intimate relationships, maybe very inexperienced as far as romantic partners, again, because their whole life revolves around food. People with bulimia nervosa are more likely to have histories of mood swings, low frustration tolerance, and poor coping. So 
Um, yeah, mood disorders are common with bulimia nervosa. Another thing that's common with bulimia nervosa is um, maybe borderline personality disorder. So more differences, um, more than one third of people with bulimia display characteristics of personality. Oh, that's what I just said. Personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder. Huh, sometimes, sometimes I think too far ahead. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, the different medical complications, only half of women with bulimia experience amenorrhea versus almost all women with anorexia. And so take a minute and think about why they, that might be. So if you haven't thought about it, that is because bulimia and nervosa because of their weight, right? They have either a normal amount of body fat or even a little too much of what's considered a healthy amount. Uh, versus anorexia, anorexia that um, are, they're very underweight. So people with bulimia nervosa suffer damage caused by purging, especially from vomiting and laxatives. So it's very, very repeated and excessive vomiting is very hard on your organs as well as your esophagus. And that's why you'll hear about uh, cases who their parents didn't know that their child was bulimic and they had just had a regular dentist appointment, a, you know, a standard dentist appointment and the dentist will actually be the one to inquire about this disorder because they could recognize the erosion in their enamel because it's really hard on your teeth too because of the acid. So moving on to binge eating disorder, also known as food addiction. So like those with bulimia, individuals with binge eating disorder engage in repeated eating binges during which they feel no control. However, the difference is they don't, they don't participate in compensatory behavior. So they don't necessarily try to get rid, or get rid of or eliminate the calories. So as a result of their binges, two thirds of these people become overweight or obese because they are not getting rid of any of it. It is important to recognize though that most overweight people do not engage in repeated binges. So just because they're overweight doesn't mean they are classified as having a binge eating disorder. So between two and 7% of the population display binge eating disorder. The binges and many other symptoms that characterize this pattern is similar to those in bulimia. So they do care about their shape and size. Maybe they do have low self-esteem and want to impress others and care about the way they look. On the other hand, those with binge eating disorders are not driven to thinness. The disorder doesn't start following a diet and there are no large gender differences in the prevalence of this disorder. So just like uh, the ratio female to, you know, there's a strong female to male ratio in anorexia and bulimia, we see about equal um, female and male for binge eating disorder. So what causes eating, eating disorders? Um, most theorists and researchers use a multidimensional risk perspective to explain eating disorders. More factors equal a greater likelihood of developing a disorder. So it could be genetically influenced. So someone who has a predisposition to an addiction um, along with an environmental component could be the right mix for developing an eating disorder. Psychological problems, biological problems, which would be um, genetics and social sociocultural conditions, meaning like the household or peers they were hanging out with. Now, I do want to note, though, something with binge eating or obesity. Um, sometimes it serves as a defense mechanism. So like I stated, these are really trauma-driven disorders. So one time I was working with an obese client who had a history of sexual abuse. And her way of protecting herself was remaining very overweight because she didn't want anything to do with males. So she didn't want to be attractive. 
she didn't want to risk being molested or raped again. So this was her way of protecting herself and surviving. So sometimes it is intentional too. Not always, but sometimes. So that was a really interesting case because it was actually served as a defense mechanism. So some argue that um, eating disorders are disturbed mother-child interactions that lead to a serious ego defic deficiency in the child and to severe perceptional disturbances. This is the psychodynamic approach. But we, we're not gonna go too much into that for purposes of this class. What I do wanna spend a little more time on as far as causes and etiology is societal pressures. So theorists believe that current Western standards of female attractiveness are partly responsible for the emergence of eating disorders, as well as not just for females, but for males, right? Because females have this overwhelming pressure to be thin, while males have an overwhelming pressure to be masculine and buff. Um, fortunately, we are seeing some improvement in this. You know, it's better to have curves, and those are seen to be beautiful too. Uh, because, you know, in the past, these models and standards of what beauty is and thin was just not realistic, right? It just wasn't, it was just unhealthy and very uh, distorted, especially for those who are developing, you know, adolescents. So members of certain subcultures are at greater risk for pressures, such as models, actors, dancers, and certain athletes. As well as for males, you'll see a lot of uh, gay males with eating disorders. And of college athletes survey, 9% of men actually met full criteria for an eating disorder, while 50 had symptoms, which is like distort, disordered eating. 20% of surveyed gymnastics appear to have an eating disorder as well. So historically, women of higher socioeconomic statuses expressed more concern about thinness and dieting and had higher rates of eating disorders than those with lower SES. However, um, now research is showing that preoccupations with thinness and other eating disorders are increasing in all SES groups. So this is really disturbing that 50% of elementary and 61% of middle school girls are currently dieting. Dieting, 50% of elementary, you guys. Um, so it's really important to provide parents with this psychoeducation. And also we're seeing more uh, interventions as far as like school presentations on eating disorders just for kiddos to be aware of. And family environment is huge. So not only peers, but family environment. So family may play an important role in the development of eating disorders. So just like a systems approach would view alcoholism as a family disorder, a family problem, so would eating disorders. So as many as half of families of those with eating disorders have a long history of emphasizing thinness, appearance, and dieting. That's that really rigid environment. Mothers with eating disorders and uh, dieter, you know, those who tend to always be dieting and place a high uh, standard on themselves are likely to have children do the same because what are they doing? They're modeling, right? So just like we talk to parents about modeling how much they're on their screen and on their technical technology, you know, it's the same with eating. So what, what, what mom's doing and what the family's promoting, the child's inevitably going to pick up on as well. So like I said earlier, uh, the way the family system interacts, uh, especially in mesh family patterns, are causal factors of eating disorders. So those who don't have good or proper boundaries. Um, have a higher likelihood of having a family member with the eating disorder. And these patterns include over-involvement and over-concern about family members' lives. So there's no boundaries here. 
There's also uh, cultural and racial and ethnic differences. So 90% of white American respondents were dissatisfied with their weight compared to 70% of Af African American teens. The study also suggests that the groups had different ideals of beauty. So how whatever their culture is, is gonna play a role on their perceptions about what beauty looks like and you know what their body type should look like. So unfortunately, research conducted over the past decade suggests that body image concerns, dysfunctional eating patterns, and eating disorders are on the rise among young African American women as well as women of other minority groups. So the shift appears to be partly related to acculturation. So just because they're acculturated to kind of the Western or American culture. Uh, but again, it might be because these cultures are not as commonly studied as a European or white culture. So again, gender differences, five to 10% of cases are males. Uh, however, this might not be an accurate statistic because it goes unnoticed or misdiagnosed. Um, the reason for this striking difference are not entirely clear, but Western society's double standard for attractiveness is at the very least one reason. Another reason may be the different methods of weight loss favored. So men are more likely to exercise and they want to bigger is better for men uh, usually. And for women, smaller is better, right? So we we want we we diet while men exercise so that might be one factor um it seems that men develop eating disorders as linked to the requirements and pressures of job or sport so the highest you know the highest rates of male eating disorders we see are jocks wrestlers distant runners bodybuilders and swimmers And what we also see, something that I should highlight just for a moment, is muscle dys dysmorphobia, which is reverse to anorexia, where the you know you can never just like anorexia, their distorted thought is I can never be too thin. Um, Any weight is not thin enough, whereas being you know I can never be too big as far as muscular. So treatment for eating disorders are very complex. Um, the first thing you want to do is maintain, you know, get them in a medically stable place. They won't, you want to get them out of any medical danger, but that is just the surface. So while that's the most important thing, making sure they're going to survive medically, um, you have not treated the problem. So a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, she's, she looks healthy again. She's gained the weight that she needs to gain back. She's good. She's recovered. Or the reverse is, oh, she lost weight. She's a normal weight there. She's good. So either they're going to relapse if they don't work through the, why it started, or they're going to pick up a different type of addiction. So again, you want to regain the lost weight and recover from malnourishment, but you and learn to eat normally. But that's first of all easier said than done. There's a lot of resistance here for anorexia, and you have to be careful because someone who goes from starving to you know sometimes they, um, sometimes the refeeding syndrome occurs, which consists of metabolic disturbances that occur as a result of reinstitution of nutrition to patients who starved or were severely, severely malnourished. So they really need to be monitored because of cardiac and pulmonary and neurological symptoms um, that occur with, you know, all of a sudden going from little food to, you know, an amount of calories uh, for weight gain. So um, there are different, for anorexia, different settings. They could be hospitalized if they're really unstable medically. They could go into inpatient uh, where they live there for a while. They could go into outpatient, which would just be, you know, once or twice a week or day treatment, which would be like an eight to five Monday through Friday. They get to go home at night and have the weekends off. 
Um, we are going to get more into treatment later, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But binge eating, um, same thing. You want to tackle the core issue, but you also want to, the media aims is to eliminate the binge and purging patterns, establish good eating habits, eliminate the underlying cause of bulimic patterns, which is really the, the main piece of the work. Uh, programs emphasize education as much as therapy. So there are, for both um, anorexia and bulimia, as well as binge eating disorder, you're going to see a lot of cognitive behavioral as far as well as mindfulness. So sometimes you'll also see dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. There's a huge mindfulness component in DBT as well as emotion regulation. So that's becoming big, especially with treating anorexia because uh, Cognitive behavioral therapy for bulimia is considered the golden standard of treatment. It's shown to be very effective. While anorexia, uh, we do not have one solid form of treatment that works. It's very, there's a lot of layers to anorexia. But for binge eating disorder, the key role of binges in both bulimia and binge eating disorders are similar. So CBT, like I said, um, sometimes antidepressants um, are provided to reduce or eliminate binge patterns and to change disturbed thinking. People with binge eating disorders who are overweight require additional intervention. Uh, but, you know, for bulimia, Prozac has been shown to work very well. Anorex and as well as Zyprex, um, uh, antipsychotic Zyprexa. For anorexia, SSRIs could be effective, um, especially to treat the mood disturbance. However, you're gonna see a lot of resistance because what is a side effect of SSRIs? Weight gain, right? So these individuals are gonna be very, very, very reluctant to even agree to begin a psych an antidepressant. And now that binge eating disorder has been identified and receiving considerable uh, attention, it is likely that specialized treatment programs will be emerging. So in the meantime, there's still a lot more research to be done in regards to binge eating. And like I said, with binges, what happens is, what are people usually binging on? High caloric, highly processed foods. Well, what comes with processed foods are a ton of chemicals. And these chemicals are equivalent to uh, the same type of high that we would get from meth or coke or, you know, because it's the dopamine that is being overstimulated. So these individuals not only, you know, what is being promoted, right? So they say that uh, food is a legal addiction, a legal addiction because food is legal, right? Everyone eats it. What is being advertised? Well, what's being advertised is food meth and coke aren't being advertised on the TV. Uh, so we're constantly being satiated with uh, cues, you know, of food. So there's kind of like sex and gambling in the sense of learning how to manage money. Food is a part of life. You have to eat. So there, it's a really finding, um, really working through the core issue that started the the disorder, as well as finding, we, we still want these individuals to have pleasure when they eat. So what, the, what you need to be careful though of is a little bit could lead to a binge, right? So, oh, I just had one cookie. I might as well just, I blew it already. So you got to get away from that thinking. That's where mindfulness comes in. So mindfulness is huge and very effective, not only just for eating disorders, but it's you know, everyone could benefit from it. And you'll see a video on this uh, mindfulness for binge eating in week seven, I believe. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that piece too, where you, you know, at least with substances, you could get rid of it all. You could change your, 
your support, you know, your social, your social group and kind of get rid of the triggers as much as you can, but food, it's going to be there. It's going to be there multiple times a day and you'll always have access to it in the, for the most part. So what really needs to, what's really being more talked about, which is wonderful, is that food addiction is not just a lack of willpower. It's not just a moral, you know, a lot like just like with substance addictions and other process addictions, people think of it as a moral addiction when it is really a brain, a moral problem when it's really a brain problem, right? So there's a lot of parallels with disordered eating, food addiction with other addictions. And, you know, what's really happening is that these, these coping skills, these addictions are developed as coping skills. And at first they feel like the person's friend. So this is my friend. This protects me. This keeps me away from the pain. And it becomes their best coping mechanism. But what happens is it ends up killing them. So it gets very dangerous and it gets very messy. So that is what I wanted to touch on this week. I realized that was a lot. So I also realized that many of us could be triggered when listening to this. We may have had an unhealthy relationship in the past or currently with food. So please kind of be mindful of your reactions and uh, know that it's okay to have, you know, to be sensitive or to be, you know, have an unexpected response to this material. If you are comfortable, talk about it in the personal experience forum or don't maybe journal about it or talk to your own personal therapist or your trusted support system. And really just take this all in because it's really important to have a good baseline of knowledge on these forms of eating disorders. I've also posted a video, uh, well, four videos this week, three of which are optional. I do realize that you have a lot on your plate, so I'm not going to make them mandatory to watch, but please just at least save them on your desktop. Like I said, it's important to build your resource library, but these videos are very insightful and they will give you a good idea of what someone's world is like with an eating disorder. It'll give you an idea of what they look like, what they come with, and how hard they are to live with, not only for the person, but for loved ones too. Okay, so take care. Thank you for sticking through this lecture. Let me know if you have any questions. Email me if needed or call me and I will see you next time.